Well, I feel very fortunate to um, be up here today talking about court-related ADR processes, particularly mediation, uh, because Baltimore County is the only county in the state of Maryland that I'm aware of that has all on-staff mediators. There are five of us, and we do about 750 cases a year. And um, there are a lot of advantages to that that I would like to just share with you. I know it's probably not something that's going to happen anytime soon because of the financial uh, cost of having on-staff mediators. But there's really about five main reasons from my perspective where I think this kind of mediation works. And the first, as I say, is that we have on-staff mediators. Um, for a program manager, this is ideal because um, I've got five people to, to, to manage and I think you have much better quality control when you have a small group like that. Um, we, can, I can, we can assure that we're all doing pretty much the same thing and there's a lot of training opportunities uh, for us. And for the mediator, I think it's also ideal because uh, I don't know anybody here who's done uh, divorce mediation, you know sometimes you walk out of one and you're just ready to scream because you've been quiet the whole time and you know, you've been this neutral the whole time and you need to debrief. Well, there's always somebody in the office to debrief with. There's always somebody to talk about cases with and get feedback. And I think that really helps us to keep our skills uh, fresh. Um, we also, um, we've been very lucky as a, as a staff mediation office to be able to participate in two of the groups that are, uh, one is the study that Lorig and Toby have been talking about where we had people from the study come and observe us for six months. And I have to say they did a remarkable job. Uh, they were very kind to the people. They, they were never intrusive. I frankly was amazed at how many people agreed to it. I thought many more people would say, no, I don't want to be a part of it. And there were very few, actually. Most of them wanted to be a part of the study, and that was great. So. Um, we had the ability to be part of that program. We also are the pilot program, one of the pilot programs for the um, ADR evaluation system that the court and macro is doing. And we have uh, every, every case is being evaluated by the, at the end of the case, the parties and the attorneys if are there, they're all filling out evaluations as are the mediators. And we're just now getting to a point where we fed enough of it into the machine that we're now starting to get some feedback on that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, another reason why I think the court annex mediation works well is the classes. Um, most of you, I'm sure, here are familiar with the parent education classes, which is basically designed to help people move from an intimate relationship to a business relationship and getting them to understand that they're now in the business of raising their kids. And it actually gives them, I think, that the classes give them some kind of hope that ultimately they can do that, even though uh, they're coming to the classes very early in the process. When they go to the, to the scheduling conference, they're scheduled for classes and mediation. Uh, one of the things I found over the years, though, because we were dealing with cooperative co-parenting all the time, that there were some families there that really can't cooperatively co-parent because of these issues like addiction and um, mental illness of a parent that's not treated or domestic violence or abuse and neglect. And so we developed a third class, you know, the, the regular parent education class is six hours long. We've developed a third class that we call the Special Challenges Workshop. And we deal with each one of those issues separately and talk about how maybe you can't co-parent the same way that we want you, that, that is the ultimate goal, but that there are ways that you can communicate uh, even when there's been domestic violence. And uh, the Family Wizard is a perfect example of uh, how that can be used. And so um, we talk about substance abuse, addiction, the alienated child, and parallel parenting, which is, uh, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, it's like parallel play. You know, Two-year-olds may sit in the same room and they might be actually playing the same thing, but they're not actually playing together because they don't really have the developmental skills to do that. And parallel parenting is kind of the same. You, know, you do your thing, you do your thing, and it's a way to, um, to get people out of that conflict and still allow the kids to go back and forth when there's serious uh, issues. And it's, we've had a uh, great response from that. I think we're the only ones doing anything like that 
that I'm aware of, but it's been very uh, successful and the parties, we get very good res uh, evaluations from the parties from both classes and a lot of times they say, had we not gone to these classes, we probably would have never been able to do that. So I think that's uh, an, uh, uh, an important point. The third thing I want to talk about is the program that we have in Baltimore County. And um, we brought Andy Shepard down from Connecticut to help us develop this program about seven years ago or so, I think. I tried to remember when, I think it's six or seven years ago. And we really do a triage approach. It's, uh, it, the hope is that we're gonna come up with a more personalized uh, understanding of what the issues of this particular family are and give them a more personalized approach to the uh, ADR landscape. So at the scheduling conference, there's a form that every participant fills out. And it asks things like, um, how, do you have, how have you resolved uh, issues in the past? Have you been able to do that? Uh, general questions about the interaction between parents, all the way up to how many times have the police been called to your home? Are you afraid of the other parent? That kind of thing. And so that form, is, that questionnaire, is really designed to ferret out the high conflict cases. And when that happens, we also have on staff licensed clinical social workers in Baltimore County, four of them. And each day one of them does the screening for scheduling. So if the, if the um, questionnaire signals that there may be a high conflict issue, then those, peop those parties and their attorneys will be screened by a, a social worker. And then that social worker will decide what track they're going to go on in our court. And we have several tracks. One is just a straight mediation track. The, no the next one we call intensive service mediation. And then the third one is an evaluation. And uh, the mediation process that we use in each one of these is the same. But what they go through before they get to the mediation is different. So if it's just a regular mediation track, they're going to go to the classes and then they're going to come to mediation. If it's intensive service, and that means there's some high conflict issue, uh, and there's, but fitness is not really an issue. And so those parties will be ordered to all three classes, and then when they come to mediation, we interview the parties separately at first, mainly to do a DV screen, just to, just to be sure, because we screen throughout, I should mention that, we screen for domestic violence at the scheduling conference, at mediation, at at every level through the building. So, uh, and we do screen them out. If anybody calls and says they don't want to mediate or they're afraid, that's, you know, I take, I'm not second guessing anyone. I'm taking them at their word and we don't do the mediation. Um, but the evaluation conference is different in that uh, this is when the, the social workers have done an in depth evaluation and they prepare a report. I know in some counties, uh, the parties never actually see the report. But in our county, the parties receive the report and their attorneys, if any, receive the report. And after they've gotten that report, we schedule them for what we call an evaluation conference. And at that meeting, it starts with the party, we always, this is a one mediation where we have always invited the attorneys. And frankly, the, we toyed with not doing that. I know it's probably not everybody's favorite thing to mediate with attorneys and I am one so I can say that, <laughs> but um, we felt like because these were the higher conflict cases that it was important to have the lawyers there to buy in so that the parties didn't go back to their lawyer's offices and get talked out of it. So we figured we'd deal with the lawyers in the, in the room. And so it's the lawyers and the parties and a mediator and the social worker who did the evaluation is there. And she comes in at first and does a brief um, oral review of her report or his report and recommendation. And so the cards are kind of on the table at this point. You know, everybody knows and certainly the lawyers know what these reports mean and the good lawyers um, help their clients through that and, and will help their clients understand where they have a strong issue and where they might be weak and it helps to facilitate more negotiation that way. And ironically, uh, the settlement rate for those higher conflict cases is higher than our regular mediations. And I don't think it's because we're doing anything differently because we're not. It's just that the process has given the parties the reality check 
sometimes that mediators can't really do. And so it's right in front of them. They know what, they've seen the social worker, they know what the social, how the social worker is going to testify, and it really does um, facilitate negotiation in that way. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we have started doing marital property mediation for pro se parties only. Well, originally we started for pro se parties, and um, now we're doing it. Some of the lawyers have asked us to do it because they want us to do it. So that's a very new thing in the mediation world. Five years ago, the idea of uh, people who weren't lawyers doing marital property was unheard of. But now, at least in Baltimore County, they're really um, starting to like that idea. So the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, and people ask me this all the time, you know, you're a court annex, you've got lawyers or judges breathing down your neck to settle cases, uh, you know, the people that are my bosses are concerned about time and how many cases get settled and all that. We don't worry about that. I counted up in, in preparation to do this, there's been 15 lawyer, 15 different mediators in the office in the 20 years that I've been there. And our settlement rate has consistently been the same throughout. So if you've got good mediators, it's the process that's working. Okay, and so that's why the, the, the uh, percentage doesn't vary at all. But people always ask me what kind of, what style of mediation do we use? You know, do we do it differently because we've got judges expecting settlements? And the answer is no. Um, if, I had to, if I had to pick a term for what we use, I would call it facilitative. But I think over the years I've changed my view on this. I personally don't believe that one, one style works all the time. I think it's a mistake for a mediator to put him or herself in a category and say, I always do this or I always do that. Because I think, I think we have to use different skills depending on the people that are sitting in front of us at the time. And sometimes maybe, you know, you might want to borrow some skills from transformative a little bit. And maybe, no, the one thing we don't do is evaluative or directive. The cardinal rule in my office is self-determination. The parties have to come up with their own agreement. Um, and that requires us to ask enough questions to help them, help them identify not only the problems but the solutions. So in other words, they tell us, well, how, they, they bring up a solution. We say something like, well, how is that going to work? What, what does that look like? Rather than giving them that stuff, getting them to come up with it th themselves. Because then I think they feel more of an ownership to it. And um, I think we come up, they end up with uh, solutions that fit that particular family, not the cookie cutter solutions we often get as a result of litigation. So um, we use parents' names, we, mom and dad, mom and mom, Aunt Susie and Joey, whoever it is, we use that. And on our agreements, we um, avoid words like custody and fighting words like that. We talk about parenting time and shall house time with. And I think every, a lot of people are getting away from that. So that's what we do. And uh, thank you. <laughs>